Alright, in this session we're going to be having a look at the US Supreme Court and part of the UK Supreme Court for the A-level Government and Politics Unit, uh, focusing on the American Unit. Uh, there's a picture of the Supreme Court there, Chief Justice Roberts in the middle, let's get into it. The process of becoming a Supreme Court Justice. Presidents appoint justices, Trump got three, and they are important to their legacy as they will likely still be on the court long after the president is out of office. The most likely list of appointments are those from the Federal Appeals Court. The record is 11 years with no Supreme Court appointments. Justices are extremely powerful as their judicial power is vested within only nine individuals and the repercussions of judicial review are immense. This is by design as each of the three branches of government must possess equal power. A vacancy opens up due to either the death, retirement or impeachment of a former justice. So we're getting into the appointment process now. Uh, possible candidates are subject to a full background check by the FBI, and they are then interviewed by the president. From his pool of potential nominees, a candidate is chosen, and they are officially announced to the world in the Rose Garden. The candidate then goes to Capitol Hill to stand before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Hearings then take place in the Senate, and questions are posed to the candidate, so the senators can assess the political opinions and competence of the candidate. The ultimate decision as to whether the candidate gets the job is dictated by a simple majority in the Senate. Only 12 candidates have been rejected in 240 years and the American Bar Association also gives you a score of how competent you are for the job. So, let's have a look at the justices themselves, and how they interact with the judicial branch as a whole, and the other branches of government to impose the checks and balances necessary for fair democracy. The Constitution mentions a, mentions a single Supreme Court, which is the highest court of appeal, and it stipulates that justices only hold office in good behaviour, although it does not officially dictate what good behaviour is. The fact that the Supreme Court is the highest court of appeal means that it has appellate jurisdiction over all lower courts, ergo the verdicts passed by the court establish binding precedents that must be adhered to by lower federal courts. There is one chief justice and eight other justices who are either expelled from office or die. Uh, you are voted on to the Supreme Court of the United States by a simple majority in the Senate, as we just went over, and you are also impeached by a simple majority. You only lose the title if you die, or are impeached, or are retired. Uh, there have only been four Chief Justices in the last 70 years. The current one is John Roberts, uh, he is a centrist, so he flips between uh, Republican and Democrat policies fairly frequently. Uh, justices are political and the president appoints them on a partisan basis. Right-wing justices tend to be strict constructionists, which means they believe the constitution should not be changed, whereas left-wing justices are typically loose constructionists, which, me which means they believe in an organic constitution that can be changed over time. Uh, Right-wing justices prioritise the power of state governments, so they prefer a devolved legislature, whereas the left-wing justices prioritise the power of the federal government, so they promote uh, the central government over the devolved state government. So, let's have a look at judicial review, perhaps one of the most important powers of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has the power to declare acts of Congress, executive orders, and devolved legislation 
that that's coming from state governments, uh, unconstitutional. Thus, they can veto a bill with their power of judicial review. The power of judicial review is not in the Constitution. The court found this power in 1803 with the infamous case of Marbury v. Madison, uh, the first time the, the Supreme Court blocked Congress, and I'll elaborate on this case further in the future. The court interprets the meaning of the Constitution and how it relates to the modern day. There are fears that justices interpret the Constitution incorrectly in an effort to further their partisan interests, although this is to be expected as they are a very uh, uh, largely politicised branch of government in spite of the fact that in lower courts it is generally expected that a judge should be impartial. So, the Supreme Court and the death penalty. 19 out of 50 states have the death penalty, and it can be carried out in four methods. The electric chair, lethal injection, the gas chamber, or the firing squad. Texas has had the most executions since 1976, 536 to be precise, and this is easy to remember as it is two less than the number of delegates in the electoral college. 88% of all executions are carried out via lethal injection, and you cannot be killed for a crime you committed in adolescence, so under the age of 18. Uh, You must take an IQ test, and those with mental disabilities cannot be executed. Uh, If you want to include an instance when this was done, I believe uh, that man... I believe his name was John Kemper, or something like that. I remember he took an IQ test before being executed, and he was found to be a genius. Uh, so you think if he was a genius, maybe he would not answer the questions correctly, but, you know, I digress. Uh, left-wing justices deem execution to be cruel and unusual punishment, so they think it is unconstitutional. Whereas right-wing justices disagree and they believe that it does not uh, count as cruel and unusual punishment as they are getting their due, uh, they are paying their due for the acts they have committed of their own volition. So let's have a look at judicial independence and how, and how it is maintained. It is crucial that judges remain independent and are not pressured by anyone such as the executive branch, the media or the legislature. Judicial independence is achieved by protecting judges in these ways. Judges serve for life or until the age of 75 if you're going to be talking about Britain. They have immunity from prosecution. They have immunity from defamation, and their salaries cannot be reduced. In the US, the Founding Fathers wanted judges to be entirely independent. However, this is at odds with the fact that the President chooses the Supreme Court justices, and it is hard for them to resist pressure from politicians. The UK is more complicated, with the Lord Chancellor and the former Law Lords making it a far more difficult process to understand, Uh, but it's not really that important, as I believe the UK did not get its own Supreme Court until Gordon Brown's administration in 2009 under New Labour following Blair's constitutional reforms and uh, House of Lords reforms. So, uh, these are two instances of pressure exerted onto the court by politicians. The first one is that Texas made flag burning illegal, uh, so this was following 9-11, and the Supreme Court said this was unconstitutional, as it uh, violated a citizen's right to freedom of expression, because uh, flag burning would be considered, I believe, uh, political expression uh, or political speech uh, so it should be protected by the First Amendment. Uh, Bush responded to this by saying that the Supreme Court was wrong 
dead wrong. Uh, so, but to be fair, Bush was not really the kind of constru strict constructionist uh, Republican that we were talking about earlier. Because obviously a lot of the stuff that he passed, uh, like the Patriots Act, and obviously the sentence he just says now, kind of violate some of the negative liberties established in the Constitution. The Supreme Court also tried to block Article 50, so the Daily Mail responded by printing their picture under the title Enemies of the People, and obviously this counts as defamation, so it is strictly prohibited. So, let's have a look at the instances of the Supreme Court interpreting the Constitution. After the 24th Amendment in 1964, the Voting Rights Act, which stopped the literacy... T Sorry. After the 24th Amendment in 1964, the, v the Voting Rights Act, which stopped uh, the literacy test for black voters, was overturned uh, with Great v. Bollinger. Affirmative action unfairly gave minority students three points over white ones in Michigan, uh, and the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 that this was unconstitutional in 2003. Uh, with regards to Grutter v. Bollinger, Michigan Law School took a more individual approach to affirmative action, and the Supreme Court ruled 5-3 that this was constitutional. Clearly one justice must have abstained there. And with Seattle v Jefferson County, uh, busing was made illegal due to a 5-4 vote in the Supreme Court. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, busing was taking black students to a different school. So, uh, that's pretty much sums it up for the Supreme Court. We're just going to have a look at some of their most important cases throughout the years. And these ones I highly recommend you include in your exam. So you've got Plessy v Ferguson of 1896, which said segregation was constitutional, and this arose from the Separate Car Act. Brown v Board of Education in 1953, this overturned the above precedent as separate but equal is inherently unequal, so segregated schools became unconstitutional. Matt v. Ohio in 1961, which said that evidence gathered in violation of the Fourth Amendment cannot be used, so this prevents unreasonable search and seizures. Engel v. Vital in 1962, stipulated that it is unconstitutional for schools to compose official school prayer as it violates the First Amendment. Griswold v Connecticut in 1965 said that the Constitution provides liberty for married couples to buy and use contraceptives without restrictions from the government. Miranda v. Arizona in 1966 stipulated that confessions obtained without Mirandaizing uh, suspected criminals violate the Fifth Amendment, so such confessions cannot be used in court. Roe v. Wade of 1973 made it legal for women to have abortions. Bush v. Gore in 2000 settled an election dispute in Florida by preventing Florida court's decisions to recount ballots. And finally, Gonzalez v. Carhartt in 2007 upheld the Partial Abortions Act of 2003. So, uh, a lot of the examples I have uh, said there, they are very uh, potent topics to use in an exam, and you'll probably be able to write quite a lot about it if you're asked about the, say, uh, repercussions Supreme Court decisions can have on a society. Well, if you're going to be talking about Roe v. Wade, which I'd say is the easiest one to argue there, you can say it gives them immense power if they have uh, made it legal for the killing of an unborn human uh, but obviously it's your opinion 
whether you want to argue, if you want to argue about some of the earlier ones, like Plessy v Ferguson and Brown v Board of Education, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, that's it for the Supreme Court, which is the head of the judiciary in America. So that pretty much sums up for the American judicial branch, which is pretty much all you need to know. Thank you.